Welcome to another edition of the Hawk Off the Press podcast. I'm your host, Gazette Hawkeyes reporter, John Steffi. I am excited to be joined by Andy Yamashita, Seattle Times UW reporter. Andy, thanks for joining me. Happy to be here, man. So first of all, UW coming off a pretty big win against Michigan. Kind of what did that mean for that program after losing in the national championship game to Michigan to then get a little bit of redemption there in the Pacific Northwest? Yeah, you know, it was interesting. All week, they kind of downplayed it. Oh, it's just, you know, these are two different teams, right? UW has 40-something new scholarship players, a new coaching staff, new everything. So they they really tried to not make it a big deal. Oh, you know, it's just another game. We're just, you know, it's a shot at the national champions. But, you know, it's it's not all about that. And then the game happened. And it was so apparent how cathartic, I think, that win was. That was the word that it came to me after I had already – followed my story and I was mad I didn't get to use it in the story but I think that's really what it was you know Washington fans have been through so much the guys who stayed from last year who chose to try and help rebuild this program after Kalen DeBoer left really you know this was a big moment for them I told people like the biggest cheer of the night was when Michael Penix walked out and the second biggest cheer of the night was when they posted the score of Alabama losing to Vandy right like that's the space that UW fans have been living in for the last, you know, eight, nine months. I think I talked to a couple of players who played in that national championship game before they played Michigan. And they were like, isn't it crazy that this is the same calendar year that we played for Michigan for a national championship for? So I think it was a big win uh, for the program, for, you know, just for the fans to have this moment in the sun, for the fans to enjoy a good win against a team that, you know, Michigan could have been unranked. And I think the fans would have rushed the field just because of everything that had happened. It really represented that they've kind of come through this really crazy stretch in the program's history. And, you know, now they can fully kind of put that behind them, move on to really focusing on this season. And yeah, you know, it was a big win. Um, This is a team that, has arguably been the best team in every game that's played this season. And yet here they sit at four and two because they gave away a game to the in-state rivals in Washington state. And they gave away a game to Rutgers that they probably should have won, right? Missed three field goals, poor execution in the red zone. So on the field, it was big. It was, you know, I think a potential turning point if they can start getting those mistakes out of the way, but off the field, I think it, it really meant a lot to UW fans and, you know, in their post-game cinematic recap, because every team has to have one now. Um, Jed Fish talked a lot about how he was going to give a game ball to all the guys who were on the team last year. So I think there's an understanding of how much it meant to the players, to the fans, to everyone who stayed, that they could be at this point again, even considering everything that's happened to them since. And not many teams seem to be able to lose the, what, eighth overall pick and still have an effective passing game this year. (laughs) Yeah, definitely. You know, I think one thing even Washington fans have had to get used to is that this isn't Michael Penix. This isn't Kalen DeBoer's offense, right? You know, Alabama losing to Vandy notwithstanding, you know, DeBoer really blew the top off Washington last year, right? They were throwing the ball 50 times a game. Penix was good for 350 passing yards and multiple touchdowns against everyone except Arizona State, basically. So I think there's had to be a reevaluation of what this offense looks like. And Jed Fish was very upfront before the season started that this is not the same offense. It's more methodical. They're more about managing the clock, managing possessions. I think Will Rogers has been everything you could have asked for a transfer quarterback coming in. I think you look at Michigan, for example, as a team that struggled with their quarterback situation. Will Rogers as a veteran comes into Washington, is running a system that he's never done before, right? Will Rogers put up crazy numbers at Mississippi State when he was running an air raid. This is very much not an air raid. Jed Fish talks a lot about how important play action is, how much pre-snap motion they have. And these are all things that Will Rogers didn't have to do when he was at Mississippi State. So, you know, there were a lot of unknowns about how he would fit into this offense. I think for the most part, he's looked really comfortable. He doesn't force the ball into places where it shouldn't go. He's taking care of the ball really well. Michigan was his first interception in six games. So it's been this really good kind of marriage, I guess, when people didn't really know what that was going to look like. There were a lot of questions about can Jed Fish 
run this offense without Ted Iroh McMillan? Can Will Rogers run this offense when it's he's never done this before at at this level? So it's been good. They've had their problems in the red zone. They've really had their problems with penalties before the Michigan game. And there's certainly still question marks, but generally I think that this team has been again better than expected, although they've lost games they should have won. So that's kind of where they're at right now, even with you know, losing not just Penix, Roma Dunze, first round pick, Jalen McMillan, Jalen Polk, both playing on Sundays. That was their starting three wide receivers, lost both their tight ends. They have no returning starters on offense. And they're still, I think, like 21st in the nation in total yards. So it's a tr- it's a testament to everything Fish has done scheme wise. It's a, certainly a testament to Will Rogers and his composure and his ability to run this system. And, you know, some of the talented players they brought in from Arizona, Jonah Coleman is probably the leading example of that. So yeah, it's, it's been, it's been impressive, but there's been obvious things to work on and offensively, you know, again, it's not Kalen DeBoer and Michael Penix, but it never was going to be. Well, that's a great segue to my next question about Jonah Coleman. Like the numbers when I'm looking at seem outstanding. Am I seeing not that this is be totally foreign for Iowa fans with Caleb Johnson, but more than five yards after contact per carry. Yeah, he's been pretty much as advertised. You know, if Will Rogers is playing above what was expected of him, Jonah Coleman was probably the biggest uh, player to follow Fish from Arizona. He wasn't technically a starter at Arizona, but he did lead them in rushing yards a season ago as a sophomore. And, you know, he's a guy who's played for Fish all three years at Arizona, was there when Fish went, I think it was five and seven his second year, went one and 11 the year before that. So Coleman was committed to them when they were one and 11, is a real disciple of Fish and his system. The Scotty Graham, the running backs coach, is another one who followed Fish. So uh, Coleman followed him. But yeah, he's been great. I think he's been a little questionable in the short yardage, but he's been phenomenal in the open field, breaks tackles, hard to bring down especially behind an offensive line that hasn't always looked great. You know, he's making the most of his opportunities averages around between 16 and 18 carries a game, which isn't, you know, the workload that some of the other premier running backs in the country are getting, but making a lot of impact with those carries. And, you know, he, they have a nice uh, tandem with him and six year senior Cameron Davis, who is maybe more of their pass blocking tight end, but also, you know, kind of a battering ram himself uh, in short yardage. So they work well together and, yeah, Coleman's been phenomenal. I think he's 12th in the country in rushing yards, again, on on less carries than a lot of the other guys who are up there. And, you know, he's gone head-to-head with Kyle Manungai at Rutgers, went head-to-head with, you know, Michigan's defensive line and their tandem of backs and Khalil Mullings and Donovan Edwards. So, yeah, I think Coleman may be a little under the radar. If you're not watching a lot of Washington football, maybe you have no idea who he is, but he's been really phenomenal for them. And, if anything, I think Washington fans would wish that they'd give him the ball a little bit more. <laughs> well, now the stereotypical question for an Iowa podcast with your kind of Big Ten welcome here. I got to ask about the offensive line. What does that kind of add to this Husky offense? Yeah, you know, it's a real... I don't want to say patchwork because that sounds disparaging, but, you know, this is a group that... In 2023, Washington won the Joe Moore Award as the best offensive line in the country. None of those guys are here right now. Two, The two tackles are both in the NFL, Troy Fautanu, Roger Rosengarten, both, I think, top two round picks. Both guards are at Ole Miss right now, who are obviously ranked, I think, either top 10 or around top 10. And the center is at Alabama, followed DeBoer there, Parker Brailsford. So this is a completely new offensive line. It's a, an interesting group. They've generally looked okay again they they're gonna give up pressures here and there it's a really young group you've got the right tackle was at san diego state last year the right guard was a rotational backup for ohio state the center was playing fcs football at portland state the left guard was had an acl injury and missed all of last year and the left tackle wasn't playing college football last year because he quit to go take care of his parents when his mom got sick. So that's who Washington's run out there for the last two weeks. Uh, the left tackle has been starting the last two weeks over the wretched freshman who started the season. But again, you know, they did enough against Michigan to win that game. They've generally protected Rodgers enough to give him time to operate. Fish clearly knows that the O-line is a little questionable. You know, I think I saw something that 
Rodgers was getting the ball out within two seconds against Michigan, which, you know, maybe not optimal, but it was, again, enough to beat a top 10 team or at least what was a top 10 team in Michigan. So it'll be interesting. Every Big Ten game is basically going to be a huge question mark for them up front. But uh, up to this point, they've more or less done what they needed to do. And really, after that Washington State game where they committed a ton of false starts, they've done a much better job of eliminating those pre-snap penalties. They still have some shaky snaps every once in a while. Rodgers isn't super experienced taking snaps under center the way Fish wants him to. So they've had a couple fumbled snaps here and there. For a while, those were their only turnovers were fumbled snaps by Rodgers or the backup quarterback. So it's certainly questionable. They still have a long way to go, but they've done enough in big games to win. And that's probably all you could ask of a group that, again, those of those guys, none of them were available during spring football either, you know? So all of them were either somewhere else or, or were rehabbing injuries. So it's a really, or no, one of them, the right tackle was here. But again, like it's a really young group. It's a really inexperienced group. There's always going to be question marks about them. And there's always going to be, um, moments, I guess, in every game that look bad, but Fish was really happy with them after Michigan, and that's probably all you could ask for with this group. And then kind of on the flip side, with Iowa being such a kind of dependent on the run offense, kind of what should Iowa fans expect to see in terms of this UW rush defense in this front seven? Yeah, you know, it's been interesting, and I got to give credit to Steve Belichick. He's done probably a better job than anyone expected of him, honestly. You know, last year, UW's defense wasn't particularly outstanding. They still went to the national championship game, obviously, but there were big questions about that defense. But there were still – that defense was really held together by guys who you could look at them and say, well, he's going to play on Sundays, right? Braylon Trice, at, uh, the edge rusher, was a third-round pick. Edifone Ufoshio, the middle linebacker, was a fifth-round pick. I think Dom Hampton, the strong safety, was a fifth-round pick. So you looked at that team and you're like, those guys are NFL players, and they're going to do enough to make everything work. This UW off defense has a bunch of guys who are playing above maybe expectations. Doesn't have a ton of guys who you look at them and say they're obviously NFL players the way that last year's defense did. And yet they're playing really well. You know, I think a big part of that is scheme. Belichick does all the window dressing. He does all the weird little things that maybe I don't know how well they'd work in the NFL, but they certainly work in college. And he's going to give quarterbacks, even experienced ones like Cade McNamara, who you know, I've seen a lot of defenses. He's, he's going to throw some weird stuff out there. He will run three safety looks, you know, throughout the game. He'll play passing defenses or pass rush defenses with no def- like no interior defensive linemen. He does weird stuff like that. And he'll make the quarterbacks think and make them have to decide. Generally, I think the front seven has been solid or, you know, again, a little better than maybe would have been expected considering – just like with the offensive line, they lost all four of their starting D linemen. They only have one linebacker. The only starter from last season who's starting for this team is linebacker Alfonso Tupatala. And he's played really, really well this season. So defensively, the defense has been the best part of this team. You know, they've, I think, haven't let a team score more than 24 points in a game, something like that, and are one of the best teams in the country in terms of yardage and everything like that. So this team's defense has really been What's kept them in games when their offense hasn't always been firing on all cylinders? Um, And then kind of secondary-wise, granted, not that that's Iowa's strength on the offensive side of the ball in terms of passing, but kind of what – or what's kind of the state of this Washington secondary? Yeah, you know, it's a, an interesting mix of guys. Ephesians Prysock is probably one of the other really big transfers that they got from Arizona to follow the staff – He's kind of had a mixed start to the season, hasn't totally been the guy that maybe everyone thought he was going to be, but he's been more than serviceable, has been a very good starter. Thaddeus Dixon on the other side has been kind of the surprise of the spring. He didn't start for this team last year, but took the starting job off of Elijah Jackson, who's the corner who made that swat in the corner of the end zone against Texas to win the Sugar Bowl. So, And then obviously they have Jackson if either of those guys goes down or needs a break. The safeties, uh, Cam Fabiculanen is, you know, one of those guys who's been here forever. He's a sixth year senior, one of the few guys who, you know, decided to stay and and see this out with Fish. He had the interception against Michigan that kind of sealed the game. Uh, next to him, they play either McKellistine, who's more of their like free safety rover kind of safety, and then 
Cameron Broussard, who's a FCS transfer from Sacramento State, who's really kind of stepped up and played really well since he arrived, again, only in time for fall camp. And so that's kind of been their secondary. And again, they've been stingy. They've been very good at limiting. I think defensive holding has maybe been their biggest problem or PI, but you know, in terms of giving up big yards, that's that hasn't really been a problem for them. Again, playing in the Big Ten, how many teams are really throwing the ball? It's not like – Jed Fish talks about this. This isn't, this isn't the Pac-12. We're not going to see 40-point games here. That's not what this league is about. It's about defense. And it's about running the ball. And so, for the most part, they've been good at limiting in long downs when Washington's defense wins on first down, holds that first play to between three and four yards – they love to trust that defense and just say on third and long, like get a stop. And this team doesn't force a ton of turnovers, but they force a lot of punts, which sounds like Iowa. So you know, <laughs> we'll see. It might not be a particularly high scoring game this weekend. Well, you'll probably run into even this year, even with Tory Taylor gone, you'll probably encounter some punting is winning t-shirts in Iowa city. And you can even get one in Iowa city while you're here. Um, <laughs> with the two losses this year, one to Washington state, one to Rutgers, is there kind of a common blueprint in terms of, okay, if you want to beat UW, you need to do X, Y, and Z? <clears throat> it's hard to say because really in both of those games, they beat themselves. In Against Washington State, they had 135 penalty yards. Washington State had 136 rushing yards, right? Like, if if that adds any context, right? And And similarly against Rutgers, they had, I think it was only like six penalties for 69 yards, but they were all in big spots, right? You convert on third down holding, or, you know, you get a stop on third down DPI. So, or, or, you know, face mask or something like that. So I think if I was Iowa, it would be about let Washington make its own mistakes, right? The, the Huskies don't turn the ball over a lot. They don't, you know, they don't throw into picks. They don't do a lot of the traditional you know, let them lose the game, but they'll, the last, their two losses this season have been completely because they shot themselves in the foot. And Michigan was a big step for them because they didn't do that, but it's certainly too early to say they'll never do it again. So I think if, if I was Iowa, I would say, let them make their mistakes, let them get frustrated, let them, you know, put themselves out of it. I think Jed Fish, almost the first thing he said when the, he was doing his Post game press conference against Michigan was like, I told the guys, let's just play Michigan today. Let's not play Michigan and ourselves. Let's just play Michigan because we can beat just Michigan. And, you know, that'll be the message for this team going forward for the rest of the season. So that would probably be what I'd say. I don't know. We haven't seen, you know, a team really thump Washington yet. Again, they've outgained Washington State and they outgained Rutgers by like 300 yards. And both times they really lost that game more than necessarily the other team really took it to them so you know maybe i can be the first one to do that but uh that's where i would say washington is right now that's how you beat washington i guess special teams the other stereotypical iowa thing for me to ask you know can the huskies keep up with iowa's usually well-regarded special teams unit on saturday that's funny you know i I've done a couple of these interviews with, you know, people from Iowa's perspective, and I've forgotten to mention that because, yeah, no, Washington's special teams has been kind of a mess this year. You know, Grady Gross, their junior kicker, won that game or secured the win, I guess, against Michigan with his his kick. But he's in the middle of like one of the worst stretches in her, his career. This is a guy who only missed four field goals in all of 2023, was extremely reliant, won them a couple games, won them the Apple Cup last year when he made like a 42 yarder as time expired. And yet this season he missed one against Northwestern, missed three against Rutgers in a game that they lost by three, and then missed the first two against Michigan before he hit the last two and, and ended up helping them win the game. So Washington special teams is certainly not set by any means, and it hasn't been a strength for them this year the way that it was in past seasons where it, you felt like anything within 45 yards was guaranteed for gross. So it's certainly against a team like Iowa that, like you said, is known for its special teams rigors, I guess, could be something to watch. And again, in a game where it'll probably be close in a game that might come down to field goals, Washington's field goal unit has not been clinical by any means. Everything he's missed has been wide left and they got blocked against Michigan. So there's certainly big questions about that. And I'm sure Washington fans hope that after he hit that last one against Michigan, he's maybe gotten out of that funk a little bit, but it'll certainly be something to watch against Iowa. 
Do you have a score prediction yet? Not to put you on the spot. Oh man, I don't have one yet. I actually have to do that today for my, <laughs> for my story, but mm, off the top of my head, maybe 17, 13. I'm not sure who wins, but <laughs> I don't think either of these teams is getting to the twenties this, this week. <laughs> I was going to say 20 to 17. And now the more that I hear about Washington's defense, I'm almost wondering, is it 17, 14, 17, 13? I've got, I think, let's see if I can do my math here, about 15 hours to decide in time for our deadline. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's funny. It's one of those ones where like, you know, there's just something that happens to teams when they go to Kinnick stadium. Like what can I, what can you say? You know, if this game was happening in Seattle, then I might be a little more willing to bet that, you know, teams th that at least Washington would be able to score some points. But again, this is, uh, you know, this is Iowa. This is what happens to every team goes into Iowa thinking they could score 25 and you you leave and the game was decided by two points. So, you know, I I'm not going to I'm not going to doubt Kirk Ferentz and his defense. And it should be a especially unique environment. Well, I don't know if unique is the right word, but extra special because there'll be their stripe out games. So you'll see the black and gold alternating sections and all that. So this is kind of crazy. UW has gotten, they got Rutgers blackout game. They've got the Iowa stripe out game and they have the whiteout game against Penn state uh, next month. So they're getting everyone's like special, like I guess people want to see the new West coast teams when they come out, but it's been kind of funny. Um, I'm looking forward to a great atmosphere for sure, personally. Well, Kinnick does not have the press box shake, so you don't have to worry about that like with Penn State. So, <laughs> All good, all good. Well, Andy, thanks for joining me. Yeah, happy to be here, man. And thanks to our listeners for tuning in. Until next time, we will talk Hawks later.